Hello. There was one thing that the children of Israel were reminded of with their stay in Egypt. It made them more longing for the inheritance that God had promised them. It made them more aware that they were only there for a little while and what God had for them was far greater and far better. I'd like to read with you an account of a man who lived in the light of that all the days of his saved life. It wasn't always the case. And for Saul of Tarsus, later the Apostle Paul, and things were quite different once he met the Lord Jesus on the Damascus Road. But I want to read from you, with you from the epistle, the last letter that he wrote, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. Verse 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Chapter 4 and verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Verse 12, And Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus, the cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments. Verse 18, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and forever and ever. Amen. Salute Prissa and Aquila, and the household of Anesiphorus. Erastus abode at Corinth. Petrophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Do thy diligence to come before winter. Eubulus greeteth thee, and Pudens, and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Feeling a bit restricted at the moment? Well, the situation that we're in has brought that about, hasn't it? But so was the Apostle Paul. And there was no virus. There was no health issue. But rather, he was in the Mamertine prison which was not anything like the house arrest that he had experienced earlier. This was now a, a damp, dark, basically a hole in the ground, rat infested, and he was alone. And while we are under a travel ban and mandated to stay put, that we cannot travel, I think of the Apostle Paul in these circumstances, and he was getting ready to travel. He says, I am now ready for my departure. There was such, a, such something touching about listening to, to Prime Minister Trudeau a while ago, a number of years ago, when he said to all Canadians abroad, it's time to come home. The Apostle Paul heard that call from the world above, from the government that he had been such a tremendous citizen of. Paul, it's time to come home. I wonder, with many of us, how much this is making us think about home, making us long for heaven, 
the experiences that we're going through right now uh, are designed to do just that. And it is a wonderful thing in light of all the circumstances that we're going through when the Spirit of God tugs at our heart and reminds us that we are going home. Many people, in light of the situation recently, have even changed their wills. They've made adjustments to them. Uh, the reality of, of leaving this world has brought a greater sense of responsibility uh, in light of that. Well, when it comes to this, the Apostle Paul never had to make any changes. He, in writing this letter, gives to Timothy his last will and testament. His last letter, 1,238 words in English, less than two and a half typed pages, are a summation of the experiences that this man had, of the perspective that this man had of life itself, and of living for the crown and living for the Christ. What a real reminder. There are three things that are stressed to us in this last letter, and I want to go over those three things with us and apply them to ourselves, because it's a good thing when you read the Word of God to apply it to yourself. If you don't do that, it really doesn't have much effect upon us. I want you to think, first of all, of his identity that is being stressed here, his identity. For most of us, starting and ending a letter, or most anything for that, uh, for that matter, any type of document, are the most difficult things. But not for the Apostle Paul. He clearly begins uh, this letter, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. His authority, his calling was paramount to him. It was the most essential thing that he had been entrusted with, and he lived with that reality and responsibility all his days. The Apostle Paul identified himself with three places in life. The first was Tarsus, which he could write of that it was no mean city of Cilicia, Saul of Tarsus. Another place he identified himself with was, with was Rome. You'll remember that when he was in Philippi and in the prison there, he had made it clear that he was a citizen of Rome, a Roman citizen. And he used that and all the privilege that went with it. But the most loved and lasting place that Paul identified himself with was heaven. He lived for that. He moved in life in light of that. Every activity that he did was seemed to be stamped with the reality of the world above and a crown and that he would win and gain by serving the Lord that he loved. For to me, to live is Christ, he could say. From the moment of his conversion, he became so aware of the world above, didn't he? Think about just prior to Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 7, and what the Apostle Paul is witnessing as he sees a man named Stephen. And he is going to die right before his eyes, be martyred. And as he does die, he looks upward to heaven, sees the heavens opened, and the Lord Jesus, the Son of Man, standing on the right hand of God. He heard those words. He saw that man die. And in the death of that man, he was reminded of the reality of the world above. Here's a man that now he was living for an earthly religion. But very shortly, on the road to Damascus, he would be forcefully, eternally reminded of the world above again. As the risen, glorified Christ would appear to him on that road and make himself known to him. A resurrected Christ. And the Apostle Paul now goes forth in the power of an ascended man, in the reality of a world above. And he could say again in Philippians, those things that were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. And so he identifies himself with this world to come, with a risen Christ. But he begins the letter with Paul an apostle, now, strange that as he's writing such a, a personal letter to such a dear friend, his own genuine son in the faith, he, he would begin with this title, with this acknowledgement, Paul, an apostle by the will of God. He had been known as a saint. What a tremendous thing to, to be called a saint, the one who had persecuted the church of God. And he's a saint 
He had made himself known as a servant, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. He calls himself the prisoner of the Lord in this letter, linking himself now not with, with a, a prison that he was part of, naturally speaking, but that which he had been taken hold of spiritually by the Lord himself. But in this title here, an apostle, he's reminding us that he's not a saint, he's not a servant, he's not even a soldier, as he reminds us of as well. He's a statesman. He is linked with the highest government in the universe, the world above. And he could say, I am appointed a preacher, an apostle, a, a teacher. He could say, Paul called an apostle. His identity had never left him. From the very beginning to the very end of life, here he is in this prison, dark, damp, alone. And yet he is so aware of the identity that is his and the responsibility that was his, called. What about you? Oh, I, I know there's no apostles today and none of us have been called to that. But nevertheless, every one of us have been called to something. You've been called by God called for some purpose, for some responsibility. I think of the Corinthians as Paul writes to them, and he could say, you see your calling, brethren, not many mighty, not many noble. Many of them that he was writing to, in fact, at the time were slaves, looked at by the world as nothings. And yet he reminds them that they were called by God. At times like this, we might feel that we're just set aside. What can we do? The Lord knows your situation. And you are still as much called to the purpose that you're going through now as you were the first day you were saved. It's a tremendous thing, even in these situations that we're experiencing, to be cognizant and aware of the responsibility that we bear and the calling that we have, the identity that we share as those who are Christ's, not apostolic but certainly actual and real in terms of our identity. We are linked with the world above. But not only the identity here that is stressed, I want you to notice his activity. Now, now keep in mind, he's in prison. He's not going anywhere. This is not now under house arrest where he was chained to a guard, where he was able to at least receive those that came to him freely. And No, this is the last letter he's going to write. His movements are very restricted. He knows that his time is very, very short. And yet look at all he was engaged in at this moment. First of all, in verse 3 of chapter 1, he says, I serve. I serve. He, he saw that even what he was doing, even in the writing of this letter, he not only served Timothy to encourage him, but 2,000 years later, he is still serving, as it were. He's serving our generation. He is doing what he can in light of the circumstances. Not only does he say, I serve in verse 3, he also says, I pray. He was praying. What, what a needed thing for each one of us to do for one another, to pray for one another. And then he says, I, I remember. I remember as he writes to Timothy, he's remembering his, his tears. He's remembering Timothy's faithfulness and so on. Many of us are remembering what we, what we like to do what we were so freely doing. When it comes to the Apostle Paul in prison, he's remembering Timothy's tears, a characteristic of this dear child of God that was so warmly found in the Apostle's memory. You know, in times like this, there's a tendency now for us to just kind of veg out, kind of just relax and just kind of not do much. Very little activity. What a opportunity for us to keep going and serving in the capacity that God has allowed us in this present situation. I think of when it comes to the Apostle Paul thinking of Timothy even here. And those that he we are reminded of, what about their characteristics? It would be a tremendous exercise if in this time that we are kind of isolated and far away from other believers, removed from the fellowship that we so enjoy, Here's a tremendous encouragement and exercise. Think of the believers that you are associated with closely. Try to think of at least one characteristic that you remember of them and can appreciate. And bring that before God 
and bring them before God. It would help us to value those that we cannot see right now. This is one thing about Paul. He was longing for Timothy's companionship. The other thing I want you to notice before I leave this section is that Paul recognized that what was happening was according to the will of God in chapter 1. Over 20 times we read of in the New Testament the, the, in relation to us, the will of God, the will of God. And as he is in this particular situation, he knows that this is the will of God. As much as we are disappointed and we are questioning what's going to happen next, clearly this is the will of God that we are presently experiencing. It, Paul's first letter, Galatians, when he writes that, he reminds those believers of Christ who gave himself for us according to the will of God. And that so touched his heart and his perspective that the last letter he writes, 2 Timothy here, he is reminding us that Paul has given himself, that the one who gave himself, Christ, so touched his heart that the apostle has given himself. And it was all according to the will of God. Dear child of God, right now, what we are experiencing, I say it again very, very forcefully we accept as the will of god to bring about his purpose not only in the big picture but for us individually to shape us and make us at this time what god wants one last thing before i leave this too chapter four now as we go to the end of the epistle and verse five in terms of this activity he speaks to timothy in writing to him and he says Thy ministry. He has told Timothy about his ministry. But now he's reminding Timothy about Timothy's ministry. And so his service, his prayers, his faithfulness. And at the end of this letter, even if that faithfulness that Paul was encouraging and writing to him about, even if it simply caused Timothy to bring him a coat, it magnified and elevated the service that Timothy could do for the Apostle Paul to a great level. What we do now is magnified by the times and the experiences that we are going through at this present day. The day determines the exercise of believers. And so it might just be bringing a coat to someone. It might just be a simple call. It might be bringing someone something of encouragement by way of reminding them how important they are to you praying for them. It's your ministry, just like it was Timothy's at that time. But I want you to think of the last point here. We've looked at, as Paul is reminded of the world to come and the world above and that crown that awaits him, he has written to us of his identity. He has written to us of his activity. But the thing that really shines through in this epistle that is so militant-minded with terms like taken captive, guard, keeping the faith, and so on, is the absolute certainty that he had and what awaited him. And there are two things that are certain from this letter. The first thing that's certain is this. Paul was a lonely man. He was a lonely man. Chapter 1, he begins desiring to see thee, Timothy. Then three times, as the letter comes to a, a, a crescendo, a conclusion, Three times in chapter 4, he writes to Timothy about coming to me. Come quickly. When you come, come before winter. And it builds. He was alone. He was in prison. He was isolated. And as he writes of these believers, it's interesting. The loneliness of this man causes him to write this list of believers. There's such a list in the book, in, the gospel, in the book of Romans, where it is so full of gospel truth and those that had been brought into the family of God through the gospel. And in the end of that letter in Romans chapter 16, we have no less than 28 names brought before us as the Apostle Paul writes concerning those who were fellow believers. But here's the last letter that Paul writes. I wish I could tell you there were 28 names here. They're not. They're only, the list is down to 16. And when we read of these names, 
It's interesting that there are only three names that were found in Romans 16 that are found in this list. Erastus, Aquila, and Priscilla. And some of the names that we read here are linked with loneliness, disappointment, failure. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. And Trophimus have I left at my lead him sick. There's something touching about the loneliness of this man, the great Apostle Paul that had experienced so much. The, the man that is assured of a crown by the Christ is compelled to ask for a coat because he doesn't have one. He's a lonely man. There's many of us that are going through that type of loneliness now. Well, not the same type as Paul did, but nevertheless, there is a loneliness to a degree. We're missing our brethren. We're missing the, 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 the gatherings of the saints, missing the people of God. But we can remind our hearts of, of other believers and pray for them that they don't defect. They don't get discouraged. That the names on the list that we pray for now will be the same names that we'll be able to pray for again once we come together in the will of the Lord. There's something else here. Not only was it certain that Paul was a lonely man, it's certain that Paul was a longing man. Why? Because the world above was more real to him than this world itself. Let me ask you, dear child of God, how real is the world above. We have our tent stakes so deeply in this world. We are affected so much by this world. How much do you live for the world above? How much does the world above have a grip on you? It's clear from the apostles writing here, the world above and the crown that awaited was everything to him because it was where the Lord Jesus was, his Savior. Set your affection on things above, our heart, our mind. Because all that we have and will have ultimately is there. And everything here will be left behind. The Lord Jesus could say, lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. And that is exactly what this man, the Apostle Paul, did. And he could speak with certainty that he knew that there was a crown that awaited. He knew that there was a place awaiting him. The story is told of a of stunning news that flew like arrows through the palace of a certain king. The king had died in his bed of natural causes. One of his advisors, who had spent time and had accompanied with the king, and had asked the question, where is he gone? There were people around that had said, well, why, he is in heaven. The advisor who knew the king well said, no, I, gravely, he said, no, I, I'm certain he's not in heaven. I've traveled extensively with him. I've spent a lot of time with him. He would talk about trips that he was going to take beforehand, and every detail was meticulously planned and anticipated. I never heard him say much about heaven. No, I, I'm sure he didn't go there. How much do you think and talk about heaven? How much do you long for that place? How much do you long to see him? One thing is for certain, that when the reality of what we are experiencing right now really sinks in, it loosens our grip on everything that is temporal, transient, the natural. And it should cause us to grab onto and hold on to that which is eternal. On the world above, the world that crowns, where the Savior that loves us is waiting for us. It could be today, dear child of God, you will see him, your Lord and Savior. 
and everything else that we have known will just be a thing of the past and the world above will become in reality our eternal home. My God, help us with the reading of this last letter of this great Apostle Paul, a man who was in prison. Speak to us concerning the world above and the crown that awaits, not to him only, but to all them, using his own words, that love his appearing. Shall we pray? Our Father, we bow in thy holy presence, giving thee thanks for a home that we have that our Lord Jesus reminded us of, that he goes to prepare a place for us, he could say, that where I am, he may be also. He could say at that time, let not your heart be troubled. We think of hearts that are troubled today. And we think, our Father, of the fact that the reality of knowing Christ and the peace that we have through him is what will chase away every troubled heart. We thank thee for one who fills our hearts. We thank thee for one who is peace itself, the one, our Father, who made peace through the, the blood of his cross. And we pray that thou wouldst speak to those who are going through difficult times right now. Some, Lord, are handling it in a, in a greater way than others. But we all need thy help and thy strength at this time. Direct our hearts into the patient waiting for Christ. Help us, our Father, that our attention, our affection, might be directed to the world above and that there might be a greater and a deeper longing than ever before of seeing him and of being with him. We ask these things now. Preserve thy people, Lord, we pray as well. Some are older, and they need our prayers in a greater way. Assemblies have not been able to come together. We pray, Lord, for thy people, both near and far. Draw near to us. Give us that strengthening help as we ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.